In stadiums routinely packed with tens of thousands, the Cretonian wrestler would enter the arena, then walk the entire oval, amazingly carrying a full-grown bull across his back. As he paced the track, the imposingly muscular strongman welcomed his cheering fans to slap the loins and tug the tail of his colossal bovine pet. Esteemed for his unfathomable prowess, he was called by the ancients Milo. Through progressive adaptations and adherence to various unorthodox conditioning methodologies, Milo of Croton became the most dominant Olympian wrestler of all time, reigning as an undefeated world champion for an unprecedented 30 years and one who went on to crown a martial career as a revered military commander. Hello everybody, John Abdo here, author of Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo. Let's go back to the beginning. To the beginning of Sybaris and then the beginning of Croton. The beginning of Sybaris started in 720 BC. Peloponnesian mercenaries traveled from the Peloponnesus in Greece and went to Magna Graecia where they founded the city that they named Sybaris. Ten years later, another Peloponnesian by the name of Mycellus goes to Magna Graecia in 710 BC and lays stake for the city-state of Croton. For the ensuing 200 years, literally, to 510 BC, when the Battle of Sybaris took place, the animosity kept building up and building up and building up until finally the Battle of Sybaris, where, as you know, Milo commanded an army of inferior numbers, 100,000 athlete soldiers against a formidable foe, the Sybarites, that had 300,000. They outnumbered Milo's men three to one, 300,000. Can you imagine seeing 300,000 soldiers with the helmets and the breastplates and the spears and the shields and the swords just mounting the battlefield? It must have been a magnificent sight. So what did happen between Sybaris and Croton? Number one, they were two different mentalities. Even though they came from the Peloponnesus, even though they were Greeks, the Sybarites quickly became very lazy. They lost the calluses on their hands and feet because all of a sudden they started obtaining all this wealth and they just started to overindulge. They were the epitome of the heads of the Hydra, which is symbolic of the sins of man, which according to the tales of mythology, that the Hydra's heads had to be severed and lacerated so they would never regrow to reform humanity. And those are gluttony, greed, lust, vainglory, despondency, jealousy, wrath, slothfulness, and piety. The Sybarites were all of the above, but the Crotonites were diametrically opposite. They relished in hard work. They were outstanding athletes. Before Milo of Croton came onto the scene, the Crotonites were fantastic runners. They're looked at as the number one athletes on the planet, the fastest man alive. Well, back then in Croton, Italy, or ancient Greece, if you look at the totality of all the Panhellenic games, and there were numerous ones, you had the Ishmian games, the Pythian games, the Nemean games, and the grand event was the Olympiad games. Telles, the Sybarite tyrant blurts his diatribe to the Cretonian. Praise me for pleasuring your eyes, for it is I who is favored by the gods. Your gods favor muscles. My gods favor gold. Muscles are necessary to endure burdens. Gold eliminates them. And with that, the tyrant unleashes an outburst of deprecating laughter. So imagine this. Imagine a Sybarite who overindulges, they're slothful, they're gluttonous, they're fat, they're sloppy, and they don't mind it. They actually enjoy showing that off. They enjoy showing off their distended bellies because according to them, that's a Sybarite's way of thumbing their nose at other people who can't afford enough sustenance. They're showing people, look, the fatter I get, the richer I must be because I can afford more food or I have access to more food. Or what really got people angry, the gods favor us more. And 
the Crotonites, this guy right here, Milo of Croton, and his teammates, he's lifting a bull. So you can imagine that his other teammates, if they're not lifting a full-grown bull, maybe a yearling, which is 900 to 1,000 pounds, certainly six months old, 650 pounds, the bulls are weighing. They're definitely lifting animals. They're definitely lifting rocks. They're definitely lifting timber. And they're definitely training for the Panhellenic Games, including the Olympiads. But they look at Milo, and they're not so impressed. And what I believe makes this story plausible because some people to me as an author of this book and just in general say did this guy really carry a bull well the reason why i think it's believable and also plausible is because multiple historians wrote about milo's strength they wrote about the fact that milo carried a bull in fact some Historians say that Milo carried an oxen, which is a big difference. An oxen weighs 900 to 1,000 pounds more than a bull. It's a castrated bull because it plows lands and it's just far more muscular. It's docile, but it's far more muscular. And it makes more sense to me for Milo to lift an oxen because a bull, how did you get a crazy bull to balance on your back and just sit there without any movement at all? An oxen, is, they say, is docile. You could ride an oxen. So maybe instead of sitting on the bull's back, you can get into its underbelly, lift it up, and walk around the arena or walk around the town of Croton like Milo is said to do. But nonetheless, there were people who criticized Milo. And even the historians that didn't like Milo, they said, what good is all that strength? So they're admitting that Milo was strong. They're admitting that Milo was muscular. They're admitting that Milo was superhuman. They're admitting that Milo was there able to carry a bull. But what good is all that strength? It's like even today, you know that a lot of us who are into bodybuilding and muscle building and powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting and strength training, we love muscle. We look at a guy that's super muscular and we go, whoa, look at that guy. I remember the first time I seen Sergio Oliva. I could not take my eyes off that guy. It was just unbelievable in our modern day muscular freaks that are just like so iconic and so magnetic. It's like, look at that guy, so impressive. But there's other people in this world that do not like that. They're jealous of that. They actually put it down. It's actually body shaming in reverse. So you get people who body shame people who are overweight. Look at those fat, sloppy, lazy, weak people. They came to Sybaris. They came to Magna Gratia. They built this big city and all of a sudden they're all drunk and they're having these hedonistic parties. There's many people around the world who did not like, actually despised the Sybarites because of their gluttony and their slothfulness and their greed and their vainglory. The Sybarites must have been really horrible people. When you read the story about the Sybarites in, in the book, it really goes to show you that finally, after 200 years of vilification and mockery, that the Crotonite says, enough of this, we're going to stand against the Sybarites, even with inferior numbers, we know we can beat them, which as we know, Milo commanded the army, a retired Milo, an injured Milo. Milo, after competing for nearly 30 years, never dropped to his knees as an Olympic wrestler. Stories tell that he killed a lion with his bare hands, unlike Hercules, who used a club and emptied a quiver filled with arrows. Milo did it with his bare hands and skilled wrestling techniques, and he walked onto the battlefield wearing the lion's pelt, and they put the effigies of his seven Olympiad victories, the bronze statues, around the perimeter of the battlefield. Can you imagine that? You have 100,000 Crotonites, 300,000 Sybarites, and then you got Milo's bronze statues. And you can imagine the sun is reflecting and and showing shadows crisscrossing of, of the battlefield of the seven-time Olympiad wrestling champion, multiple-time Panhellenic champion. Never in the history of mankind has this much of a decorated athlete stepped onto the battlefield, let alone commanded an inferior army to decimate a formidable foe, i.e. the Sybarites. So let's postulate a little bit. Let's postulate on what people, the people who liked them, the people who loved him, 
the people who had to wrestle him, and the people who went to war with him. Let's postulate what people thought, what they seen when they seen Milo of Croton. It's like, look at this man. We have a God living among us. It's not like the stories of Hercules and Gilgamesh and Achilles and all these other mythological muscular or superheroes. Milo was a mortal figure. Another reason why I believe Milo's story, they referred to him as the second coming of Hercules. Hercules is a son of Zeus. So Milo was referred to as a god, as a demigod, as a god-man. Seeing Milo, you walk into the palestra and you look at him and you go, what in the world is that? How does a man become so muscular? How does a man become so beautiful, so godlike? Now imagine his opponents. Can you imagine what they're thinking when they draw a lot? It's alpha, alpha, beta, beta. It's like, oh man, I'm wrestling Milo at this competition? But remember, Milo, I don't think wrestled, literally tangled up with an opponent as many times as he had W's or wins on his record because of the fact that he won a lot by Akaniti. Akaniti is winning by no dirt, never stepping into the pit at all, dustless victor. You are a dustless victor if you don't step into the pit. And you don't step into the pit because your opponent is injured or forfeits the match, or in Milo's case, there's no way I'm going to be set home on a gurney or in a body bag, <laughs> if they even had body bags back in those days. So if it's not all of us, most of us are impressed with big muscles and strength, and we go out of our way to learn about these types of athletes, and to mimic them. We do the strength training. Everyone wants to know about Milo's strength training. Oh, he lifted a calf every day, and as it grew, well, I don't have access to animals, so in the gym, I'm going to put five pounds on today, 10 pounds on next week, 15 pounds on the week later. After a month, I'm, I'll go up 20 pounds, and I'll incrementally progress the resistances that are burdening my body, and my metabolism will adapt accordingly. So as odd as it sounds, Milo of Croton, as impressive as he is and how long his name has remained extant over 2,500 years and how all of us, me and you, are still interested in this story on Milo of Croton, there were people who put him down, who criticized him, who said, what good is all that strength? What good are all those muscles? But... By them saying that, what good is all that strength? What good are all those muscles? They're still admitting to the fact that he had big muscles, that he was the strongest man ever in the history of mankind. But they admit that because to them, that was something that they did not endorse. I'm John Abdo, author of Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo. I hope I shed a little bit more light on this story and the phenomenon of the great Milo of Croton. We'll catch up soon. Other than mocking Milo's superhuman strength, unprecedented athletic achievements, and enormously large muscles, there are other reasons how and why the Sybarites provoked the Cretonians into the Battle of Sybaris. Reasons you don't want to miss that are detailed in Wolves of Croton, the untold story of Milo. If you are enjoying this content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe, and I'll continue to bring you more fascinating information on Milo of Croton and other great mythological and mortal figures from antiquity. I'm John Abdo, thanking you for watching. Stay strong and healthy, and perhaps one day, thousands of years from now, People then will be remembering your name as well.